Now, there, there's, there's one other correction that needs to be added because in a, you have to mount the sample some way in, in your magnet. So you have it hanging in the magnet, and there's wires on it to make contacts. And so you have a changing field in the loops of wires there, and you get a, a, an inductive voltage picked up in, in, the, uh, in the signal as, as well as the uh, Hall voltage. Uh, that is proportional to the derivative B, and so you get a Hall voltage and a derivative of B voltage, the inductive pickup, which is 90 degrees out of phase. These are AC voltages. And now over here, we still have these voltages. They're still there, but in fact, they're DC voltages. Okay? So we managed to, to, to make the voltage we want to measure, AC, and brought along this other little AC voltage that we'll have to deal with, and kept the voltages that, we weren't, that were giving us the troubles to be DC. So, that can make life a little bit easier because now I can take my input signal that looks like this we just wrote down, put a capacitor out here, and on the other side of the capacitor I've gotten rid of my DC terms. Okay? And notice I did this without using current reversal. Okay? I've just used frequency space to separate the Hall voltage from the DC voltage and, and use the capacitor as, as one, that's one way that that you could think about separating those out. And then this goes into a lock-in amplifier to, to measure these two terms. And the reason we use a lock-in amplifier is because we, we, need, we can use phase-sensitive detection to separate the Hall voltage, which is in phase with the magnetic field, from the inductive pickup, which is 90 degrees out of phase. So, so if you could properly phase your lock-in to the phase of the magnetic field, then your X channel would read the the uh, Hall voltage and your Y channel would, would read the inductive pickup. And this term is usually small, but it, it, it's always there. Notice it doesn't depend on the current. It only depends on the frequency in the magnetic field. And so uh, at some point, as this Hall voltage gets smaller and smaller, this term becomes the dominant term and limits the, the, the gain you can use in the lock-in. So this ultimately can, can limit your the, the measurement that you can do with the Hall voltage, but this, this with careful design can be on the order of a few microvolts rather than the 700 uh, millivolts that we saw in the, in the earlier case. Okay, but notice I carefully said there if you could phase your lock into the magnetic field, you would have that condition. But of course, you can't always do that accurately. So, so what, what is the effect of a phase error? So instead of getting this, if I had a phase error of, of, of phi, then what I would measure in my lock-in would look like this. Okay? And that looks a little more complicated because now I have mixed the Hall voltage and the inductive pickup. However, I notice that the Hall voltage depends on current. The inductive pickup doesn't. So now if I do current reversal, and I'm doing current reversal now for a different reason than I was in the DC case, I can eliminate this term and, and just get those terms so now I get, get a Vx and a Vy that depend only on the Hall voltage. And so I, I can measure my Hall voltage by doing current reversal in an AC measurement. All this discussion ignored the capacitance in the measurement. As your resistor gets higher, that capacitance becomes important because basically you have the capacitance in the cables here going into the lock-in. And so there's always an AC current flowing in this, through this capacitor in your sample, and the assumption we, we did earlier was there's no current flowing in there, so you have to take into account the loading of the capacitor. And when you do that, then it, you just add an, an, a, a uh, resistance of the sample between the two lock-in contacts times the omega, the frequency times the capacitance of the cables. So, so this ends up becoming a calibration error, uh -huh, where, <clears throat> where you've now, instead of measuring the Hall voltage, you're measuring this product. And this is, becomes more difficult to take out. Either you somehow know your capacitance ahead of time in our sample, or you measure at a couple of different frequencies to separate it out. But th this, this becomes more difficult and ultimately limits the accuracy of the, of the measurement. So if we assume about a 20 puff capacitance in the cables, which is, which is a pretty reasonable number, then we can see that, that for a tenth of a percent error at a at 10 millihertz frequency, 100 millihertz frequency on 
on the uh, magnetic field, uh, we'd be limited to about 80 megohms. A uh, 1% error would be about 800 megohms. So this AC method is good to something like a gigohm. Okay, above a gigohm, you're probably not going to want to use the AC methods. You, you, you probably need to go back to the DC me methods. Okay, sign of the Hall voltage. As I said before, it's not unusual in a DC measurement of, of a uh, low mobility material with, with a reasonably high misalignment voltage. At one time you measure and you get P-type, next time you measure and you get N-type, and you really don't know what the sign of your, your voltage is. Okay, so, and, and the, the, the Hall voltage uh, is a type, may or may not be the, the type of the carrier depending on the transport mechanism, but for most materials, the, that, that certainly is the case. And so, if, if I say what my signal to, if I measure my signal to noise ratio, then this gives me, and I assume no, that I have Gaussian distribute, normally distributed noise about the mean, so this is a measure of the standard deviation, then this gives me the probability of, of getting the wrong sign. So, so this, this basically allows me in my measurement, if I measure my signal to noise ratio, that I can, I can assign a, a probability of, of getting the wrong sign, or conversely, the, the probability that the sign I picked is correct. So here's some measurements that we did. This was a microcrystal and silicon sample, three different samples. Uh, the, the Hall voltages all ran you know, from 50 microvolts, 18 microvolts, and this one was high as 300 microvolts. This, this one was N-type. The signal to noise ratio here was almost 40. So, so with this, this assignment is, is you know, very, very good. Uh, the the uh, inductive pickup was about a microvolt. The resistivity was uh, uh, 2100 ohms per square. The Hall coefficient was 77. The mobility works out to be 0.36. And this was measured in a, in a field, uh, an RMS field of 6.5 kilogauss. This sample that has slightly lower Hall voltage was P-type material, signal to noise ratio was eight, so that, that uh, uh, is still pretty reasonable. Again, the inductive pickup was around two. Uh, the, the resistance was much higher, uh, 12,000, and its mobility worked out to be 0.23, just about the same. The, these two samples here, uh, despite the low mobility, uh, when measured with a DC method, uh, gave uh, pretty similar results. This third sample, which had actually had the highest Hall voltage of, uh, of the batch, was P-type. The signal to noise was you know, 1.6, so this is getting, there's like, you know, 5% chance this, this is the wrong uh, P-type, the wrong assignment of the sign. Uh, but the inductive pickup signal was bigger. Uh, the resistivity was a whole lot bigger. Uh, and the uh, mobility was 0.11. A DC measurement of this sample uh, didn't get the sign right, uh, got a mobility of about 10. So it, it uh, uh, was not possible to measure this with a DC uh, method at all. Some zinc oxide uh, materials, uh, much higher uh, mobilities, uh, magnetic fields. Uh, again, the uh, Hall voltages were uh, fairly high, good signal-to-noise ratios, n-type materials in this case, uh, ductive pickups were small, and, and so these, these were fairly easy, straightforward materials to measure with the AC method. So just to uh, wrap it up and, and review here, the uh, uh, DC field method, the offset voltages can be much larger than the Hall voltage, which limits the dynamic range of the voltmeter, and then practically we, we say that a mobility of of 10 or less can be difficult to measure with fields with one Tesla. Of course, you can always go to higher fields, but that gets to be, be harder. Uh, increasing the current in the DC measurement increases both the misalignment voltage and the Hall voltage, so it doesn't really buy you a lot because you're, you're still, you haven't increased your dynamic range on the voltmeter. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the misalignment voltage can change in time, producing systematic errors in the Hall voltage uh, when using field reversal. AC, uh, ultimately the inductive pickup is going to limit your sensitivity, so, so you want to keep that as small as you can. Uh, in our 
in this current uh, design, that's, the practical limit for the hall voltage is about half a, half a microvolt is, is the, the limit we think we can reliably measure. High resistances cause a phase shift that cannot easily be removed. This pr produces an error in the hall voltage and limits the resistance of AC systems to something around a gig ohm. So we can build a chart here of common materials that, that you measure. Yeah. And, and whether AC or DC is, is the appropriate me method. Uh, and so in conclusion, we use DC Hall effect. We can, we, we, material mobility less than 10 are difficult to measure. With the AC Hall method, this can be extended to 0.1 or lower. Thank you. <laughs>